Hello everyone, it's Brian. Uh, today I'm going to take a short break, an intermission if you will, from orchestral maneuvers in the dark. But don't worry, there are more OMD videos to come when I get around to it, but when well, that'll be soon probably. But I thought I would just um, take a break from that and show you some things I've been playing recently from my collection. But first I wanted to just say that something really weird on YouTube happened, and I'm wondering if other people have had this experience. Now I always check the comments, I, I read them all, I, I think I've replied to every single comment I've ever had. And I also check the held for review queue because sometimes things are hidden there. But today I had a number of comments that were made four to five months ago that I had never seen before that are suddenly appearing in the comments that were never in the held for review thing. Uh, and then there were comments that were made 20 or 30 hours ago, you know, almost, a, I guess, a day ago that also never appeared until uh, recently. So it's a very strange thing. Um, in any case, I guess it's a YouTube glitch. So no OMD today, but um, I thought I would just put a, a video of a few things I've been listening to recently. And so the first one is um, The Only Band That Matters, The Clash, live at Shea Stadium. As you can see, this is a concert that was recorded in October 1982 and then released on vinyl and CD in 2008. This is the only vinyl version. It's 180 gram vinyl, restored, um, originally recorded by Lynn Johns. And this was from the... Uh, tour, the Who's Fair, so-called Farewell Tour from 1982. The other act on this tour was, or in this particular show, was David Johansson from the New York Dolls. Here you can see the um, list of tracks right for, right back to the beginning and up to uh, you know, some stuff from Combat Rock. So a pretty good show. It's probably the only, is it the only officially released live Clash album on vinyl? Maybe. Uh, so on the inside we have um, the other thing I, I I I read this short essay of course and and I've had this for a while it's not not necessarily new is that there was fifty thousand people in the in the crowd so I'm, I don't know about uh, the Clash uh, live experience but that might be one of the biggest shows they played perhaps uh, some famous people showed up like Andy Warhol over here and David Bowie over here. So I'd say this is a pretty good collection if you like The Clash. And I do like The Clash. So it's not much else to say about that except uh, it's good to hear live Clash. I never got to see them uh, ever. So I guess that'll be a substitute. Uh, another thing I've been listening to recently is Black Sabbath, Master of Reality. Now, I, I just, I realized when pulling this out that um, I had never shown any Black Sabbath records since I've been on the vinyl community, and that's kind of funny because I do like them and I have others by them. This is the, this is 1971, uh, and it's a good record. I, I really enjoy the Ozzy Osbourne period. I guess it ended in 1979 when he was fired, shall we say, for alcohol and drug issues that's my memory <laughs> so the first the, uh, the Ozzy Osbourne period is, is great I don't know very much to be honest about the period after that um, so I can't really say much about it but um, that's a good record this is oddly um, a 2011 remastered version on 180 gram vinyl which I got somewhere probably for a really good price just to see if it sounds any different or better and it sounds really good so that's a good one to have the third thing I was listening to recently is King Crimson Starless and Bible Black this is 1974 between Lark's Tongues and Aspic and Red I would choose Red as one of my favorite King Crimson records and I think other people would make the same same con same uh, conclusion but this is uh, a really interesting record. Um, my memory of this record is that it has a lot of improvisation on it. So The Great Deceiver and Lament, I think, are the two tracks that are preconceived and probably rehearsed and recorded. The other ones have at least some measure of improvisation or some partially live things. My memory on this is a little weak, but the gatefold looks like this. This is the Ed Ed Editions EG Collector's Edition 
I'm not sure what collector's edition actually means. This is, um, many of my records are Canadian presses. So this is a Canadian pressing. I don't know if it's from 74. It might be, it might be from the mid eighties if I'm remembering correctly. I often like this, you know, sometimes when I'm going to talk about a record, I sometimes look, look it up because I want to see what <laughs> it said about it. And I found an interesting comment on uh, Wikipedia relating to this track called Trio. And you'll see there are credits for f the four musicians in King Crimson at the time. Now, I don't really like this track very much, but uh, I have to read this because I think it's kind of funny. It says Trio, Trio was notable for being a quartet piece with only three active players. John Wetton on bass guitar, David Cross on viola, and Robert Flip on flute metro, uh, mellotron. Bruford spent the entire piece with his drumsticks crossed over his chest, waiting for the right moment to join in, but eventually realized that the improvised piece was progressing better without him. His decision not to add any percussion was seen by the rest of the band as a crucial choice, and he, re and he received a co-writing credit for the piece. I think that's pretty funny that you can get a... A writing credit for doing nothing but I guess uh, that's uh, how they decided to do it. it's kind of interesting and this is um, I the only King Crimson records I don't have I think uh, on vinyl are USA and Earthbound I think I have everything else I'm pretty sure everything else except for some of the later you know there was the Orpheum show and the live in Toronto show which I don't have oddly but I have everything else and they're a favorite band the next them. item that I was listening to recently is the Wolfgang Press. This is called Bird Wood Cage. Uh, let's, should we take a moment to really enjoy this cover image of this ancient toilet with this awful wooden <laughs> toilet seat? This toilet looks like it's 100 years old. Uh, it's kind of a gross cover. I guess they were going for something unusual. The back is a little more palatable, this tiny stove here, but this is from 1998, the band's third record. You will either see this band described as being post-punk, new wave, and occasionally industrial. And I really enjoy them. On this particular uh, record, Kansas is a fantastic track. Now, they always make me, they always remind me of a, a vinyl community member called Mike, who is, his channel is called Play Vinyl on the Milky Night, because he's mentioned them a few times. And uh, I'm always hoping that I will find more um, records by this band, but they, they don't seem to come up very often. I have two records from them, two LPs, and the rest are seem to be hard to find. But we have lyrics on this side and information here. So from London, this is from 1988. And uh, yeah, if I ever see the other ones, I will definitely pick them up. And the last uh, record that I played recently that uh, I wanted to mention is f by a singer from Bristol and at some point in her house uh, either my partner was I think she was singing the song I don't know how we heard it she started singing it or, I, or some humming it or something and I said oh I have that record so I I went and got it uh, a little while later to play it and realized quickly we both realized that the record is not that good <laughs> so it's a uh, Nick Kershaw, Human Racing. Now, the track that we were reflecting on was Wouldn't It Be Good, which is fine. It's a pretty good pop song. I guess you would say he operated on the fringes of New Wave, sort of New Wave, but more pop. And my impression is that his second record is better, but I, I don't have it. Uh, this one I probably got at a thrift shop. I'm, I'm pretty certain of that. So it was fairly, fairly cheap. I think there were two other singles, Human Racing, which again, not that great, and then I Won't Let the Sun Go Down on Me, which I believe got some airplay, and it's not bad, but altogether, the album really doesn't do that much for me. And, and once again, I was curious to see, oh yeah, this is the debut from 1984. I was curious to see what other people said about it. So <laughs> I looked at Wikipedia, and they have this uh, really delightful statement that they take from um, uh, a magazine called Smash Hits, which gave a, a negative review and in the review, they give it one out of 10 stars. And they called it competent, but relentlessly dull, synthesized meanderings of no importance to anyone but Mr. Kershaw himself. And even he doesn't sound that interested, which I think is probably one of the most accurate record reviews I, I've seen. <laughs> so apart from Wouldn't It Be Good, you know, the rest of the album is not that great. So. I uh, am eventually going to run out of space where I keep records, so I guess at some point I'll have to do a purge, and I'm afraid this might be one of the ones that I purge. In any case, uh, I'll be back to OMD 
hopefully soon. And uh, thanks once again for watching.